Coming up, Seth's incredible story of survival and recovery after a dramatic fall, and a ballet dancer trusts God for healing. Welcome to 700 Club Canada. Thank you for joining us today. You know, have you ever watched someone do pottery? They get this clump of clay and they start to build it and they're molding it. And at first you're kind of like, what are you making? Like what is really coming together from this clump of clay? And then all of a sudden you see when they're finished, it's this unique display, this gorgeous piece of pottery. And it was only known by the potter themselves at the beginning what it was going to look like. Well, when we surrender to God, it can feel like that sometimes in our life. You're kind of wondering, God, what are you doing in my life? What's happening? We see the building and growing as we go along. But the good thing is when we surrender to God, we can trust in his plan for our life. And we're going to see that in today's stories. But first, hear Seth's incredible story of survival and recovery after a dramatic fall and learn how his faith and prayers led to a miraculous recovery. It had been an unusually warm February day in Grand Rapids, Michigan, when Nate Wabenga and some friends went skateboarding downtown. Before I knew it, Seth was like, hey, like, you know, I'm going to climb on top of this building. And then another one of my friends, Hunter, also was like, hey, I'll go up there with you. Seth Alfaro and another friend wanted to catch the sunset. But when they got to the top, Seth decided to jump down to the adjacent building, an abandoned, empty auto shop. And before you knew it, we heard like a bang. And then Hunter was screaming at the top of his lungs. This dude literally jumped up there and is down 14 feet. Dude, Seth, are you all right? Nate and the others broke into the shop to find Seth lying on the floor unconscious and fighting for breath. Jumped the roof, literally fell 14 oh, feet. We knew it was very serious. There was the thought that like he might not make it. They called 911 and Seth was taken to Spectrum Health Center in critical condition. Soon after, his parents, Christopher and Christine, were met by a police officer at their home. And the first thing she said was, Seth Alfaro had a bad accident. and. My first thought was that he was dead. They rushed to the ER where a trauma doctor told them what happened. He told us that he had fallen about 25 feet and that he had bleeding in the brain. They had already done a CAT scan. They hadn't been able to get any response from him. I said, could he die from this? And he said, yes, he could. Doctors also said if he did survive, the odds were against a full recovery. Seth was sedated and put in a cold, dark room to try to reduce the swelling on the brain. They said, there's nothing we can do for the damage that's done from the fall. They said our job now is to keep the swelling down, to keep him alive. And I just put my head down and I said, Lord, you got to help me. I can't do this. That's all we did was pray nonstop. I mean, nonstop. If I paced the room, it was just prayers after prayers after prayers. Over the next several days, Christine's sister kept friends and family updated on Facebook. I like to think of it as this wave of faith that just held us up. And it was like immediately everybody jumped on a miracle. It was some of those posts, some of those prayers, you didn't feel like you were alone. You just felt like you were surrounded by prayer. Eventually, doctors felt Seth would survive. Now the family prayed for a full recovery. I did worry for sure about what, what, kind, of life what kind of life he'll have. How much of Seth? Will we ever really see Seth again? A week later, the swelling had gone down enough for doctors to do an MRI. The results showed extensive brain shearing. We heard shearing, that's all I heard. He didn't say anything else and knew. Okay, now we're looking at the worst case scenario. Dr. Sam Ho explains. Well, shearing is almost like you have sandpaper, you shear. So like the brain torsion and so on. So the mental function is not going to be good. You're affecting the speech. You're affecting the processing. People with this type of picture generally don't do well. 
Doctors told Chris and Christine they should start looking at long-term care facilities for their son. Still, the family continued asking God for a miracle. We're not a people of despair. And so it was important to us as a family to, to just rest in what, you know, all things work for the good of those who love and serve him and called to his plan. That was the mentality. Doctors started bringing Seth out of sedation, looking for any signs of healing. First began with him kind of having slits, you know, just barely, you know, he'd open his eyes. We're like, hey, Seth, how are you doing? And then he closed his eyes. As each day passed, they brought with them new signs of hope. He was reaching for some of us, like his nephews. He put his arm around them. He, when I was sitting on the, on his bed, he grabbed me and, and hugged me. And that was like amazing. After two weeks, Seth was transferred to the Mary Freebed Rehab Center. His progress was so rapid, his doctors couldn't keep up. The physical therapist was like, I don't even know how to plan for him. Like, I'll see him one day, make a plan for the next day. I get there the next day, he's already passed it. To be able to recover in such a fast pace itself is already amazing. But to the extent of how he recovered and the rate that he recovered is incredible. On March 30th, 2017, only six and a half weeks after his accident, Seth walked up the steps to his home on his way to a full recovery. They expected me to be at Mary Freebed or the Rehabilitation Center for 10 weeks at least, and then go on to assisted care living. And I left in four weeks and was jogging out of the hospital. <laughs> Prayer does so much more than you could like ever even imagine. I just thank God every day, like, oh my goodness, like, thank you, you know? Today, Seth has no residual issues from the fall, only a renewed faith in the one who saved him. God knew when he healed Seth, he was also answering hundreds of thousands of people's prayers because he knew then what would come of it later and how many people he could reach through it. And that's amazing. That was the other part of the miracle, was the body of believers mm -hmm. surrounding a hurting family and surrounding us with prayers to get us through this time. And, you know, that's, that's the thing I'm thankful for. God, like, is a miracle. And it's, it's, I don't know, I just keep saying, like, I'm so blessed, but, like, this is nothing I did. That was all, that was all God. You know, as a mother, watching that story really is hard to process. For them, it was like their world turned upside down in a moment, and they felt helpless to help their child. Yet in the middle of all this chaos that they were experiencing, Seth's family did something remarkable. They prayed, and they weren't alone. They had friends, family, and as we saw, even strangers joined in, creating this incredible wave of prayer. And it wasn't just a one-time thing either. It was like they were carrying Seth through these dark days with their faith. I think we can all relate to that feeling of helplessness when someone we love is hurting. Maybe you've been there, sitting in a hospital room or by the phone, waiting for news, and feeling completely powerless. In those moments, all we can do is pray and trust that God is listening and that He is in control even when things look impossible. There's a verse that comes to mind. It's Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. That's what happened for Seth's family. They prayed, and a peace that doesn't really make sense in such a scary situation settled over them. The peace that came through prayer not only sustained his parents and family, but it also served as a powerful witness to those around them. The collective prayers of family, friends, and the community formed a wave of faith that carried Seth to healing. If you need that peace today, then I would just encourage you to call our prayer lines at 1-855-759-0700 so we can give you a free pamphlet entitled Peace. Well, next, hear Donna's journey from giving everything to her ballet career and struggling with isolation to finding transformation and hope when she finally stepped into church. 
Hello, my name is Michelle, and I'm a prayer partner with 700 Club Canada. We have an amazing team waiting to pray with you, and we're available every day. We want to make it easy for you to connect with us. All you have to do is pick up your phone and call us at our toll-free number, 1-855-759-0700. And don't forget to let us know how God answered your prayers. We want to celebrate in your victories too. Our number again is 1-855-759-0700. We look forward to connecting with you today. Donna Mortelli has dedicated her entire life to perfecting the art of dance. A professional ballet dancer, she performed around the world until retiring from the stage at age 33. Then in 1988, she felt God's calling to start a dance program for children and adults called Beautiful Feet. I set up the bar program completely that the Lord gave me, wrote the manual, trained instructors. As with her ballet career, she gave it everything she had. I was teaching like every day, creating choreographing classes and putting it all together. And I just kept going and going and going. The more she poured herself into her students, the more frustrated she became when they didn't take it as seriously as she thought they should. I was stressing about it, really stressing about it. I let it affect me personally. I'm like, why can't they do this? For Paul, Donna's husband of nearly 40 years, it was nothing unusual. Like most workaholics, they seem to have a difficult time understanding people that aren't. Then in 2015, after 27 years of running the program, Donna started slowing down. Paul thought it was just signs of age. Sometimes I would uh, caution her about, you're going to make yourself sick. Even Donna thought she heard God tell her to stop during her prayer time, but she kept going. Then one day in class, I was leaning over teaching, and all of a sudden I couldn't see. I, mean, I saw spots, and I was really dizzy. I thought I was going to faint, and I'm like, I don't have any balance, and I'm moving around. I hope my praying that my students wouldn't notice. Over the next few days, her heart rate became elevated. She also developed insomnia and a host of other symptoms. I started itching all over, dizziness, other allergy symptoms, congestion, and my eyes were blurry, my vision was affected. The symptoms went on for months until eventually she had to give her classes to other instructors. Meanwhile, doctors could find nothing wrong. I was confused distressed, depressed. Taking her to the doctors, left and right, appointment after appointment, and I'm beginning to wonder, Lord, what's going on here? I mean, is she gonna die? The couple asked friends from church to pray with them for healing. I know people were praying for me, and they were warring for me, and sometimes I would feel it, you know, and I'd get a little remission, but mostly I was chair-bound. A year after the symptoms began, Donna saw integrative nurse practitioner Robin Eldib, who found that Donna had abnormally high levels of cortisol, the stress hormone. When they stay in that heightened response for a long time, then they will start to wear after a while, and then there's different stages that are even worse than the one she was in, where they really start to go down, and then you really can have a crashing. Donna was sent home with supplements and told to rest, but neither offered her much relief. Most days, she couldn't even leave the house. I had fatigue, like it wore me out to go upstairs to the bathroom, literally. And I'm saying, Lord, how can I serve you from my chair? Having suffered for two and a half years, Donna wondered if she would ever find an answer. Then on August 28, 2017, she mustered up the energy to go to church with Paul. There is praise and worship, they're singing, I'm praying, and I said, Lord, please take my pain, please take my body aches. And very, very clearly, I heard from this side, that's, it was the Lord, I heard, drop it. I've got this, I've heard about this. 
I've got it. You're healed. The scripture, cast all your cares on him for he cares for you, came right to my mind. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to drop it. It's yours. Within hours, her symptoms began to subside. First, it was the allergy symptoms, and then the vision and the, the dizziness, the seeing spots, then the aches and pains. 24 hours later, I was, I was healed totally. I mean, I would, had my old energy back. Very, very positive last time I spoke with her and felt like most all of her symptoms had been resolved and doing much, much better. After a few days, Donna went back to teaching a full load of classes. Now she makes sure to rest physically, but also to give God control of her life. Before, I would say, well, I did this and I did that. But now I say, the Lord did this through me. The Lord gave me this program. The Lord creates my classes because he does. What I learned out of this, and I think what Donna has too, is that we, we need to give everything over, the mundane as well as the big. I know that he is very present always. And he is working through me. It's all his work. It is not mine. Now, isn't it easy to wonder if God is really in control when things don't go as we planned? When Donna's career came to a standstill, it must have felt like her purpose was lost. But here's the beautiful thing that I've learned about God's plan. It's not always what we expect, but it's always good. Proverbs 19 verse 21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Donna's experience is a testament to this truth in Scripture. Her purpose wasn't confined to the stage. God had a bigger, more meaningful plan for her, one that she could only discover by stepping into a different chapter of her life. Donna's story reminds us that our purpose isn't defined by our achievements or the roles we play. It's defined by the God who created us, who knows us better than we even know ourselves and who has a plan for our lives, even when we can't see it. When life takes unexpected turns or when the things we've worked so hard seem to fall apart, we can trust that God is still in control. He is the one who weaves our experiences into a greater purpose. So whether you're in the middle of a successful career, feeling stuck, or maybe somewhere in between, know that God is in control of your purpose. Like Donna, you might just need to take a step of faith and trust that God is leading you exactly where you need to be. So I just want to pray for that right now. God, we just thank you that you are in control of our lives. And so God, I pray that we would know when we need to step out in faith where you're calling us to in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we would love for you to call our prayer lines today at 1-855-759-0700. And we have a resource for you entitled Faith. When we return, we'll explore the art of lament and why it's important to be honest about where you're at. Have you ever had a conversation or been in a meeting where you've smiled through gritted teeth and you've nodded your head only to walk out the door or close the video call and scream at the top of your lungs in frustration? Maybe that's just me then. Perhaps in our pursuit of positivity, we have almost outlawed struggle. We've relegated those feelings of pain, the questions that trip us up and the frustrations of life into the shadows. They become emotions that are okay to have, but only when you keep them to yourself. Not for public consumption 
and definitely not for prayer meetings. We've lost the art of lament. This is a passionate expression, a deep call to deep kind of cry, a profound demonstration of sorrow, yet somehow we seem to have tempered this into something more palatable for our Western culture. Instead, we put on a brave face, we cover our hurts with band-aids and hope that it'll pass, pushing it down far enough that we can just get by and maybe, just maybe, we'll deal with it later. Can we be honest for a moment? How often do we actually go back and deal with these things? Maybe you're better at it than I am, but I don't think it's something we do well. I think we shy away from it, even in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Perhaps we feel like we shouldn't bring those types of feelings, those emotions to God. Friends, God is big enough to deal with our emotion. He's big enough to hear our questions. He isn't put off by our struggle, even our unbelief. You know, as a father myself, I want my children to bring all of their emotion, all of their fear, all of their insecurities, all of their questions to me. I would never want them to feel like they couldn't. So then how much more does our Father in heaven want us to bring all of ourselves in all of the rawness to him? Just think of David for a moment. He brought the good, the bad and the ugly to the feet of his father. He brought the whys, the hows and the wheres. Why has this happened? How can I feel like this? Where are you? Lament is important. Our real raw cry to God is important. If you're still not sure, read the book of Lamentations. No, vulnerability is not a weakness or lack of faith. If God is God, then he can deal with the rawness of our heart. And in the cry, he responds, lifting our eyes and our hearts, reminding us of who he is and who we belong to. In this space and time we find ourselves in, I pray that we rediscover the art of lament. And as we do, I know with all my heart, we will find a father who hears us and holds us in our cry. Bless you. Hi, I'm Shirley Thiessen, founder of Corner Bend Grief Ministries. You know, every person has a deep longing to be seen, heard, and loved, but never more so than when someone is grieving the loss of a loved one. Our mission is to create experiences and resources that offer compassionate, practical ideas to spark hope and healing in every broken heart. No one should have to grieve alone. And we're never more like our Father God than when we are caring for the brokenhearted. But many people need encouragement and best practices to be a caring grief companion. And it's your support that actually help, opens up opportunities for us to widely share those best practices. And because of you, there is a growing number of people who are sharing hope, the hope of Christ, with those who are hurting. So thank you. Thank you. Your generosity is life-giving. One of the things I love about the ministry of 700 Club Canada that we're doing here is supporting ministries like you just heard from. People who are impacting people all across the nation. 
but we can only support them by you who faithfully support us through the work that we're doing. So we would love for you to partner with us in that and to become a 700 Club Canada monthly partner. And if you call now, we'll send you a prayer guide entitled Pray with Power, a new teaching that reveals keys to effective prayer. This is our gift to you for faithfully supporting this ministry and helping transform lives. You'll also receive our monthly newsletter, Frontlines. So call now, 1-855-759-0700. We all need a jumpstart in our faith. We all need a jumpstart in our prayer life. Pray With Power is invigorating. The videos I felt were anointed. I did some deep reflection. I felt like the word was working in my heart. You know, there's always room to grow in wisdom and strengthen your faith. So I think everyone should walk through with Pray With Power. Pray With Power, 40 days to transform your prayer life. Call now or go online. On the next 700 Club Canada, Joseph gets a serious wake up call and see how Jahan is set free from the darkness of nightmares. Well, we've been asking the question, is God in control? And we see in scripture, we see in these stories and the testimonies that we're hearing that God is in control. I think sometimes the question we need to ask is, are we surrendering to God's will in our life? Or maybe are we holding on to something that really we should be releasing so that God can do more uh, with our life than we could think. You know, whether that be something that's a sin in your life that you're trying to hide, or maybe that's just not stepping out in faith when you felt like God was calling you towards something. If maybe you resonate with that today or you're wondering, am I allowing God to control my life? Am I trusting in his control or his purpose in my life? Well, then I would encourage you, go to God's word. He always will fulfill things according to scripture and his word. Then maybe we need to repent if it is a sin, or maybe we need to just recognize an area where we're not being obedient to God's call. And then I would encourage you to find support, find a community, a church, or someone that you can process and pray this through. Well, we want to do that right now. We want to pray with some of you who have submitted some requests. Eloise says, I have cancer in three areas going on four years. The chemo is not working any longer. I'm believing God for a miracle. Thank you for your prayers. And Susan says, I need prayer for myself. I have arthritis in my spine and feet. So let's pray for Susan and Eloise. God, we just pray right now. We thank you that you are a God who heals. Uh, you are a God who perform miracles. And so we just pray for healing in both of their bodies. In Jesus' name, that you would touch them from their head to their toes um, and, and that they would know that you are with them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our power verse today is Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. It says, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. So that, go with that encouragement today. Thank you for joining us.